Hey everybody, welcome to camp. I hope you've had a great week so far, and I hope today that you're ready to learn about some nuclear power. My name is Trey Lewis, and I'm a nuclear engineer at the Harris Nuclear Plant, uh, which you see right here. If you live in Raleigh, you might have seen our big cooling tower as you drive down Highway 1, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that is later. Uh, but let me just tell you a little bit about the plant first. Uh, we make about a thousand megawatts of power every year, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. But that's enough power for everybody that you know and everywhere you've ever been. Uh, about 700,000 different houses and businesses in the area. We were built in 1978, and currently our plan is to keep going all the way through 2046, but we've actually got plans underway to to operate even past that date. So we're gonna be around for a really long time providing clean energy for you, for all your friends. Duke Energy has six different power plants. We are one of them. You can see us right up there on the map in Raleigh. But we've got all of them around Charlotte and North and South Carolina, and there's always plans to build more plants as well. Duke Energy makes electricity a lot of different ways. And you can see on this chart here that about 34%, that's about a third of all the energy that we make comes from nuclear. The rest from comes from coal, uh, which is shrinking all the time. We're shutting down our coal plants. You might know that coal is maybe not the best form of energy. So we're shrinking that down. Natural gas, hydro and solar. You might have seen solar panels or heard of hydro plants. Those are growing. So in the next 10 years, uh, we're going to keep making nuclear power, we're going to be making less coal, and we're making a lot more hydro and solar energy all the time. So what exactly do we make here? I've said it a few times. We make electricity, but what is electricity? Think about it. Did you say the movement of electrons through a conductor? Maybe not. We're going to talk a little bit more about what exactly that means as we go on, but that's what electricity is and that's what we make here. And you use electricity in every part of your life to turn on your TV or play video games or to turn on your lights and even to do a bunch of stuff that you probably hadn't even thought of. Our process of making electricity is very simple. Ultimately, it boils down to this. First, the power plant makes steam from heating up water. How do we heat up water? We'll get to that. That steam then turns a turbine now let's stop right here it is turbine not turbine i don't know what you've heard but the word is turbine anyway so we make all the steam the steam spins around shh, hits the turbine the turbine spins fast and then the turbine turns a generator and that generator produces electricity we can talk a little bit more in the q a session about how exactly that works but essentially it's a big magnet spinning around in a cage and there's a law of electricity that says that, that generates an electric field whatever point is that's how the electricity is made Basically, it's this. It's a much more complicated version of this, but this you can make at home. So what we have here is a little teapot, and what's in the teapot? It is filled with water, right? So if you heat that teapot up, and you can use coal, or you can use gas, or you could use oil. In our case, what we use is a process called nuclear fission. We're going to talk about that more in a second, too. So we use that to heat up the water in this teapot, right? And what comes out of the end of the teapot? It's steam. The steam comes and it turns the blades of this fan, which is called a turbine. And that fan is connected to a magnet, which is turning, and it's turning really fast, really, really, really fast, and then it creates electricity. That's what it looks like at our plant. These diagrams are the same. Uh, here's our teapot, right? This is our steam, or this is our uh, reactor vessel right here. That's where the goods are, and we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, that's where all of the water is. That's kind of our, our teapot. Um, so what happens in there is we have a nuclear fission reaction happening, and that means uranium atoms are splitting. Again, we'll talk about that more in a minute. That boils water here in the steam generators, and those steam generators make steam, and they go here, and look, they turn the turbine, right? The turbine spins. It spins fast. It spins fast, and that's connected to a generator, which can creates electricity and it goes out here through all the, there we go and then to your house but what happens to all the water right the water that we use the steam the water that we boiled it turned into steam and then it turned the generator what happens to that well it goes through the turbines into something called a condenser where it gets cooled by lake water and here's our lake water harris lake it's right next to our plant it cools off all that steam and what happens to steam when it gets cooled off do you know turns back into water, right? 
So the water then condenses, that's why it's called a condenser, and then it goes back into the steam generators and then the process continues from there and it turns back into steam. So like I mentioned earlier, we're gonna talk about energy. What is energy? At our plant, we make about a thousand megawatts of energy every year. Energy is the ability to do work. It is the capacity or ability to cause physical change. That seems kind of like a silly definition. So let me let me help you get it out there. Um, you need energy to move things, right? If I push, 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 push on a wall and the wall doesn't move, have I used any energy? No, I haven't actually. That sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. I haven't changed anything. All I did was exert force. Force is required to create energy. You have to move things. So when I change something from one state to another, I've moved it and I've created energy. So for your example, um, in order to make a light bulb turn on, is the light bulb changing when it's off to when it's on? Yes, it's changing, which means energy is being spent. About how much energy? About 60 watts. That's how much energy it takes to use a light bulb. So we make 1,000 megawatts. What's a megawatt? It's a million watts. So we make 1,000 million watts. That's a lot of light bulbs. There's all sorts of different kinds of energy. Here we have an apple. What is that? When you eat food, your body changes that into energy. It's something called a chemical reactions, chemical energy that happens inside your body. It's the exact same thing because you're changing the state of the apple from an apple, from a physical thing you hold into your hand into energy that you use to think and to breathe and to run and do all the stuff that you do all day. Um, you have these little music notes here. Sound, sound is energy, right? Something is happening, boom, make a sound like that. And that creates waves through the air that you then hear. That's energy transfer. Uh, we have a roller coaster here. It's something called potential energy. That's like gravity. So when you start off high up on a roller coaster and then suddenly you start moving, why are you speeding up? It's because potential energy is acting upon you to make you accelerate. We have the sun here. The sun is actually a type of nuclear reactor. It's a nuclear energy that's happening inside the sun. It's nuclear fission, slightly, or, sorry, it's nuclear fusion, which is slightly different than what we do at our plant, but it's a very similar thing. We have electricity, we've already talked about what that is, and then we have fire here, that's thermal energy. Uh, so there's all these different types of energy that happen uh, everywhere, and, and at our plant, we use um, nuclear energy to create electrical energy. So basically, we're converting nuclear energy inside of an atom into rotational energy of the turbine into electrical energy through the power lines and into your home. So really all that we're doing is just moving different types of energy around from one place to another. But what we rely on is something called the atom. And we're gonna talk about this. Um, I'm sure you've heard about atoms before, but an atom is the smallest unit of matter. Or is it? The answer is no, it's not. We're gonna talk about that more in a second. Um, but let's talk about an atom because that's what's really important to us. So here we have the Bohr model of an atom, which is not 100% accurate, but you know it it's, works for what we're talking about. Um, if you have more questions about what atoms actually look like and what they actually do, we can talk about that in the Q&A. As it turns out, it's way more interesting than what it looks like here. But this is a good model. So we have in the middle here called the nucleus, and that is made up of neutrons and protons, and you're gonna to need to remember that. Floating around the outside are these little tiny particles called electrons. Now a proton has a positive charge. Can you see that? Positive charge. A neutron has no charge, and an electron has a negative charge, negative. Um, you're gonna to need to remember that because we're gonna talk about that a lot more here in a second. Now remember how I mentioned that maybe the atom is not the smallest unit of matter? Well, as it turns out, it's not. Um, there are what's called subatomic particles, and they are little tiny things that are even smaller than protons and neutrons and electrons, and those are floating around in there, and we're still discovering those all the time. Last year, in 2019, we found a new one, the Higgs boson particle that you can see right up here. This is new. We didn't know that this existed until 2019, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, that doesn't affect what we do at our plant very much, but it is affecting the way that we think about nuclear power in the future. We'll talk about more of that in a second as well. Um, so how does it actually work? What you see here is a big atom, uranium-235. Does anyone know why we say 235? 
That is its atomic number. That's its isotope number, right? That's how big it is. There's different types of uranium. Um, there's uranium-238, 235, 231. All those things describe how many neutrons are inside this uranium. And that's important for us for this reason. We gonna, we're going to hit one of these uranium atoms with a neutron. Where did the neutron come from? We'll get there. The neutron hits this uranium atom and then boom, it explodes, right? And it releases other tiny, smaller particles. It breaks it up into a bunch of different little pieces. And what else happens? These little neutrons come out of the collision. They break off like that. What else do we get? And this is the most important part. We get heat. We get a lot of heat, and that's good. We want that heat in order to make our nuclear reaction happen, right? Because we're trying to heat up water. That's the whole point of this here. So when these neutrons break off, off of this reaction, they go and they hit other atoms of uranium. And then those uranium atoms split, and then they release neutrons, and that releases heat. This process is called a chain reaction. Maybe you've heard that term before, but that's exactly what we rely upon in order to make all this heat, to boil all this water, to turn our turbine, to turn our generator, and to make power for your home. So what does the uranium actually look like? Well, it looks like a Tootsie Roll pop. I don't know if you've ever had a Tootsie Roll. Here's one right here. And this is what our uranium atoms actually, our uranium pellets actually look like. They're small, they're cute. Uh, you definitely would not want to eat one like a Tootsie Roll though, that's for sure. And that little pellet there, that is equal to, in energy, about a ton of coal. How much is a ton? Does anybody know? It's 2,000 pounds. How much do you weigh? Depends on how old you are. We'll say maybe 50, 100 pounds. So 2,000 pounds, that's a lot of you. A lot of you stacked on top of each other, right? That's how much coal it would take to get the same amount of energy that our little pellet here gets. And so that's why nuclear power is so clean and it's so good at what it does is we get so much energy. There's so much heat built up inside of that little thing that we can use just a little bit and make a whole lot of power. So you see over here on the right side of the screen, one nuclear reactor like our plant making a thousand megawatts of power is equal to 10 million solar panels, right? So if you wanted to replace our plant with solar panels, you'd have to put up 10 million of them. Or if you were gonna use windmills, you'd need 1,800 of them. Or you would need eight coal plants to replace just what we do with our one little plant. Um, so nuclear power is some strong stuff. And that's, that's what we do here and that's what we're good at. Uh, our, our fuel pellets are stacked into these rods. We don't just use one, there's a whole bunch of them. You can see they get stacked up in these little rods and then put in the reactor like that. It's something called a fuel assembly. That all goes in the reactor core and that's where we have our chain reaction. And here is our reactor core. I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Incredibles, the first one, the good one. Um, but that, the big um, robot monster thing is designed to look like our reactor vessel here. You can imagine, right? It's got those big spider legs coming off like this and the claws that come like that. You know what I'm talking about, right? Here it is. Anyway, so if you've seen that movie, then you know what this is. Of course, ours doesn't have feet on it, but that's the idea. Um, and nuclear power is being used in all sorts of new different ways. There's other ways that we're using uh, nuclear energy. And one of these very exciting ways is in something called a nuclear battery. Um, and what we see most of those is what's called a radioisotopic, isotropic thermoelectric generator. Nobody's got time to say all that, so we just say an RTG. Basically what happens is the radioactive material, which is uranium or plutonium or whatever it's gonna be, um, it makes a lot of heat, just like it does in our reactor. And then we have something that called thermocouple that translates that heat into electricity a lot like what we do at our plant. Uh, this might seem like what are we going to use this for but there's one thing that we use these RTGs for all the time and that is in space. Look at that astronaut. Look at him on the moon and what's that by his foot? That is an RTG. How about that? What is this? This is a space probe and what's it got on the back of it? There it is. This is the New Horizons probe. This is the one that we sent out to Pluto. So this one's currently all the way going out to Pluto, and it's going to be taking pictures of all that stuff, and it's getting all of its power from nuclear energy. How about this here? This is the Mars rover, and look at that on the back. What do we see? An RTG, right? So on Mars right now, we've got nuclear power uh, powering the Mars rover, taking us pictures and videos and sending us all this information about Mars. And all of that is possible because of uh, as you might know, nuclear power is extremely safe and very secure. We've got armed security guards. We've got barbed wire fences. we got hand scanners. we got metal detectors. It's like going to the airport, but like 
twice as intense. It's super, super hard to get in. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're not there right now doing this presentation instead is because there's just, it's, it's hard to get in. We don't let just anybody into a nuclear power plant. Our control room is where all the cool stuff happens. Look at all these knobs and buttons and everything going on. You might be asking yourself, but Trey, this is 2020. Why do we have knobs and buttons and things? Here's a picture of it from 1978. Look at that. They look the same. Why do we have all these knobs and buttons? Why can't we just make a computer control all this? Let's think about it for a second. Have you ever heard of a hacker? I'm sure you have. What do hackers do? They hack into computers and they take control of your computer and they make it do things that you don't want it to do, right? At a nuclear power plant, do we want hackers controlling our systems? Absolutely not. Guess what you can't hack into? A button. You can't hack a button. How about a knob or a switch? You can't hack a knob or a switch. So that's why we have all that up in there. And so maybe it looks kind of funny, maybe it looks kind of old, but there's a reason that it looks like that. Now, one of the questions that I always get is, oh, you work at a nuclear power plant, I bet you get a lot of radiation. But in fact, that's not really true. Um, radiation, we measure every, we measure radiation, something called REM. Um, and we break that down into millirem. So you're probably familiar with this milli convention, right? So we have, for instance, a meter, right? A meter is about three feet long, it's about that big. And a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. So a thousand millimeters make a meter. So just like rem, we have a rem, that's one unit of, of, of radiation. And then a thousand millirem make up uh, one rem, right? So uh, your average American, that's you, you get about 620 millirem each year um, from just living your life. And it comes from the sun. Every time you eat a banana, you get about 0.2 millirem. So if you want to eat about 6 million bananas, you can make yourself sick with radiation poisoning. So go ahead and try that. Um, when I work at the nuclear power plant every year, I get about one extra millirem. So that doesn't sound like very much. It's because it's not. There's just not that much um, radiation that the worker gets at the nuclear power plant. So people always like to ask me, like, oh, do you have a third arm? And I get to tell them, like, no, there's really not that much extra radiation that comes from working at a nuclear power plant. Let's talk about some benefits of nuclear energy. I've, I've mentioned a lot of this already, but uh, let's just talk specifically about it for a second. First of all, uh, two thirds of America's clean air energy comes from nuclear power. Now, this is a big talking point nowadays. I'm sure a lot of you have heard, heard about the Green New Deal and about carbon emissions and all the stuff that happened that we're talking about. Um, all that really applies to nuclear energy. We put out zero carbon emissions every year. We are 100% clean. Uh, we don't put out any carbon dioxide, any carbon, any methane, nothing. We release no gas at all into the atmosphere. Now, you might have driven by our cooling tower like we showed earlier, and you might have thought maybe that's smoke coming out of the top or maybe it's carbon dioxide coming out of the top, but actually all that is is water vapor. Do you know what water vapor is? It's just clouds, right? So we just have a big old cloud machine. We're just pumping clouds into the sky. It doesn't harm anything. It's got nothing in it except old H2O. Um, and two thirds of that clean air energy in America comes from nuclear power. And as we progress, we're gonna to try to make that number more and more. We're gonna to have to rely on nuclear even more to meet those energy goals. Um, we're always clean, we're always on, right? A lot, of nuclear, a lot of types of power plants turn on and off and on and off, but nuclear power plants, we don't ever need to turn off. We just keep on rolling. We turn off about once every two years or so just to put more fuel in the reactor, but it's quick. Turn off, put the stuff in, turn it back on. So it's always power coming out all the time. Um, we, we provide power to about 7 million homes uh, in the Carolinas. That's a big deal. That's a lot of people. Um, and then on top of that, we're just reliable. We're making power 24-7, like I mentioned before. Um, there's something called capacity factor that's kind of complicated. We could talk about it more in the Q&A if you want. Um, but basically what that means is if you say you're allowed to make 1,000 megawatts, how many megawatts do you actually make? Well, what we make is basically a thousand megawatts. We make exactly what we promise. Um, but for something like solar, so let's say that you have a thousand megawatt solar field, so it's it's allowed to, it's capable of making a thousand megawatts. What's its capacity factor? How much does it actually make? On average, solar fields only make about a third of their capacity factor. So you can only get maybe 300 megawatts out of a thousand megawatt solar field. But in nuclear, you get what you pay for. You get a lot of bang for your buck. So that's another a, a big benefit of nuclear power. So 
basically all I have for the presentation. I would love to talk more about you guys. I'll be tuning in live for this session. Uh, hit me up with some questions. I know a lot about a lot of stuff. So uh, let me know, and I hope this was interesting to you. I hope you're having fun, and I'll see you in a second. Thanks.